It was early May, and uh, it was 40 below zero, and I was on top of the world. I was standing at the North Pole. And um, what many people don't understand about the North Pole is it's just ice. There's no land. It's not like um, Antarctica, where there's land and there's, there's no research stations there, there's no flag, there's no landing strip, there's no generators, no tents, nothing. No Santa's workshop. It's, um, it's just ice and snow. And the only way you know you're there is your GPS tells you that you're there, it's 90 degrees north, you can't move in any direction without going south. It's 90 degrees north. And the thing is, the ice is always moving, sometimes as much as three feet per second. And so you're there on top of the North Pole, and then it's over there. The ice is always moving, which can be incredibly frustrating when you're trying to get to the pole. So all day long, you're dragging your sled, you're skiing or walking or whatever it is, and making great strides, and you look at your GPS and you realize you've made no progress at all. The ice has been moving south faster than you've been moving north. Frustrating. It gets worse. Some days, the ice is moving faster than you're moving north, and so you actually lose ground. At which point you say, okay, time to put up the tent. But what time is it? You have no idea. It's the North Pole. That's where time zones converge. It can be any time you want it to be. <laughs> if it's not a total whiteout, which it usually is, you can try to get your bearings by looking up at the sun, which turns a perfect circle over your head day after day after day. <laughs> I'm crazy enough to have had this experience more than once. I've been to the North Pole twice. I'm telling you this because the North Pole um, is emblematic of the Arctic. Whether it's Russia or Barrow, Alaska or Norway, there's something strangely compelling about it. On the one hand, it's violent, it's cold, it's extreme, it's harsh, and on the other, it's really delicate and really fragile and pure and absolutely beautiful. Ten years separated my first visit from my second, and the change was profound. My first visit was traveling through the ice and up and over pressure ridges like this one. Um, pressure ridges are multi-year ice, giant building-sized blocks of ice that you have to kick off your skis and crawl over and drag your sled. These are the pieces of ice that polar bears like to hang out on. My second visit, no pressure ridges, none. It was all open leads, open water. We spent most of our time just trying to figure out which way to go to get around them and worried about whether camp was going to break up beneath us. So I'm a journalist, and I've covered a lot of stories in my career. Um, I've covered more presidential campaigns than I care to remember. Enough said about that. Uh, <laughs> I've covered snow leopards in Mongolia, um, medicinal plants in Tibet. I've covered uh, what's in George W. Bush's top desk drawer, what kind of shoes the Supreme Court justices wear, some of it totally arcane, some of it vitally important. But I have never covered a story this compelling. Never. You've heard all about it. You've heard about the receding glaciers. You've heard about oh, melting permafrost, thinning ice. Some of you are probably even steeped in the scientific jargon, carbon sequestration, the albedo effect, ocean acidification, so much so that it's becoming numb, and that numbing is a problem. I'm a journalist, and my job is to seek the truth, bear witness, and report it. And a lot of us are doing that, but people already have stopped listening. So. 
I've been trying to figure out what I can do as a journalist, and I've been thinking the best thing I can do is try to put a face on it, try to put a face on the Arctic, humanize it. My partner, he is a geologist, and he thinks of life in millions of years. He likes to mess with my head, and he says, climate change, the earth will be fine. People are screwed. <laughs> but I like people. I am people. People are fun. Four million people live in the Arctic, one person per square mile. Their world is changing, and it's about to change even more. Nations, and not just the seven nations that are Arctic nations, of which we are one, by the way, are racing to build icebreakers like this one, get to the Arctic, and claim the resources there. Oil, gas, minerals, marine mammals, fish. And as this ice thins and the water opens up, this vessel traffic brings with it environmental problems, invasive species, contaminants, emissions. Antarctica, on the other side of the world, has an international treaty in place. It bans oil and gas development. It bans military operations. It has strict environmental protections in place. The Arctic right now has nothing like that. The four million people have no protections in place under one unified law. Who are these people? This is Vasily Baranyuk. He's Russian. He studies snow geese. He has for 30 years on an island north, if you can believe it, an island north of Siberia, Wrangel Island. It's just in the summer, in the spring, it's just Vasily and the polar bears. He studies snow geese migration, and he's been getting his drinking water from the same stream for the 30 years, but thawing permafrost is leaching so much into his stream where he gets his drinking water, it's no longer drinkable. This is Shane Akia. He's eight years old. He is Siberian Yupik, and um, he lives on St. Lawrence Island in a village called Savunga. St. Lawrence Island is halfway between Russia and Alaska, it's in the Bering Sea. His dad and the men of the village for thousands of years have been hunting seals and walrus to put on the table for food. But thinning ice has meant that's much more difficult and much more dangerous to do. This is Faina Gutz. She's Chukchi, and she is of a family of reindeer herders, nomadic reindeer herders, um, mostly off the coast of Chukotka. But warming summers and longer summers have meant invasive plants are coming in and other plants are crowding out the lichens that the reindeer eat and the berries and the plants that she harvests, which are her only source of vitamin C. These people are good people. They have taken care of me. They are resilient. They are the least likely to contribute to climate change. They are the most affected right now. You may not harvest seals or pick berries for your daily dose of vitamin C, but the consequences of what's happening in the Arctic, we will feel. It's ridiculous to think that the change that we're driving ourselves isn't going to affect us. You've heard the numbers. Average American, one year, responsible for melting a chunk of ice 500 square feet. That's the size of this stage, a huge chunk of ice, about the size of the block of ice I was standing at the North Pole. Our president-elect has tweeted, climate change is a hoax perpetuated by the Chinese to undermine business. New tweet, well, maybe I believe in climate change, but it's not man-caused. You know what, that's background noise, it doesn't even matter. It's already happening. Ocean acidification, it's affecting the shellfish and the oysters you eat right here in Seattle. Change in the jet stream, it's affecting corn and wheat production in Kansas. Coastal erosion, villages are slipping into the sea in Alaska, threatening 
seaside resorts in New Jersey. Vancouver's reconsidering its waterfront. Plants, birds, bees, trees, fires, drought. It's all related, it's all connected. And what's happening in the Arctic is not staying in the Arctic. Which brings me to one last face, and what a face. <laughs> this is Borge Ausland, he's Norwegian. He's an amazing polar explorer. He's like the polar explorer. He's been to the pole, I don't know how many times. He's been to the pole, he was the first to go to the pole by himself, unassisted. Then that wasn't enough, he decided to go by himself, unassisted, in winter. Total darkness. I spoke to him when he was coming off the pole, and he said to me, traveling in the Arctic for him is a meditation. It's a mental thing. And that he's frightened, scared, by the change that he's seeing. This is a man who swam across open leads of the Arctic Ocean, pulling his sled behind him in total darkness. He's afraid of what's happening to a place that he says he no longer recognizes. I'm no Borgay Ausland, not even close. I did buy the same boots he had, because I thought maybe... <laughs> <laughs> My feet were still cold. <laughs> but I do respect his idea that the Arctic is a meditation, it's a mental thing. It's a wonder. And so, many of you will never set foot in the Arctic. You don't have any desire to set foot in the Arctic. But it's still there, it's in your head. You can sense it, you can feel it. The vastness, the isolation, the remoteness, just the purity. Sixty years ago, a woman named Marty Murray, she wanted to protect a tiny portion of the Arctic, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. And she went to Congress and she said simply, will we have the wisdom to cherish such places, to leave such places in their natural state, humbly and with appreciation? I've spent sleepless nights in the Arctic, crying myself to sleep, chipping the ice off my eyelashes, realizing I gotta get out of the tent, walk circles around it, I'm not going to sleep, just to stay warm, just walking circles around the tent. And when I'm home, in my own bed, just knowing the Arctic is out there, intact, in its terrifying beauty. It's how I get to sleep. I hope that we have the wisdom to cherish such places with appreciation. My hope is that we are greater than our own short-sightedness, that we will alter the course that we're on. The Arctic matters. <laughs>